Hey, this is Annie. And Samantha. And welcome to Stefan Never Told You, a production of iHeartRadio. Wow, my voice kind of gave out in that intro. Oof. Oh, um. <laughs> things to come. They, oh, what? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. What? Please don't put a curse on my, well, my money maker. <laughs> <laughs> Your money maker. My money maker. I love voice. it. I love it. Uh, so this uh, brings us to another edition of Sminty Fiction. I have a little teaser for you all. We are at the end of my one shots, which means we're going to move into a longer form, continuous one. Next. What? Yes, which I'm very excited and nervous about. It's kind of nervous putting these Love things it. out there. But I am excited. I think it'll be great. Mm-hmm. As always, if this is not your deal, totally cool. We only do this once a month. It won't hurt my feelings. Um, if you're like, nope, <laughs> not for me. Uh, also, as always, Christina. Amazing. Thank you. These would not uh, happen without Christina. She brings it to life. Love it. She does. So, Samantha and I have a lot of uh, stuff going on in our personal lives. I know uh, we've alluded to some. I know everybody does. But so this one might be a bit uh, shorter because uh, there's some moving. There's some vacation, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so a lot's going on right now. This one might be a bit shorter. So this one is interesting for a couple of reasons. We've talked before about dreams and dreaming uh, and how women, gender differences in dreams, but also how in the pandemic, my experience has been, my dreams have become more vivid and more wild Mm. than they ever have been. And as of late, I've noticed I have a lot more uh, sleep paralysis happening where dreams are happening with the sleep paralysis. And it's terrifying. It's so scary. But I do get... What I feel like, and I know that's kind of a trope and people make fun of it, really good ideas from my dreams. <laughs> hey, that's yeah. even better though. Yeah, there's been so many I've written down where I just have like the title and the basics and they are in our like Sminty Fiction folder because I might come back to them. Uh, I had one last night where <laughs> Sebastian Stan tried to kill me. <laughs> but then he Did became... you watch Fresh again? No, I didn't. I didn't. And then he became best friend. He was mad about my Winter Soldier costume. And so I guess that was the grounds to kill me. And then he became best friends with my my one of my best friends, and I became very jealous. <laughs> but <laughs> anyway, this story comes from that, because this is actually a really vivid dream that I had. And my love of time travel horror. Do you have any like thoughts, opinions on time travel? I love I love a good trip on time travel for sure. I like I like that whole perspective because I I really lived wishing we and again this is very much me being a part of white culture not realizing how damaging it was but like mm-hmm. in the 1930s 1940s because I love the old school musicals mm-hmm. love so any of that 1950s really wanted to be a part of that um, not realizing as an Asian woman I wouldn't have done much but. <laughs> Yeah, like, there are moments. And then also because the unknown of way back when mm-hmm. feels, like, interesting. Like, you can get some good stuff, like witchcraft and all of that. Like, that yeah. exists today. And we know good horror can be... But when we talk about the witch and stuff like that, mm-hmm. when it throws it back, it feels even more ominous. Yeah. Yeah. And I also... I'm somebody who loves puzzles, and I feel like a good time travel movie or story... I like trying to put together, like, the pieces. And I think there's a yeah. horror in thinking you can go back and fix something and then it makes everything so much worse. Even worse, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so with all of this in mind, let us get into the fiction portion of this episode. When I was 11 years old, a man knocked at my door. Four crisp, demanding knocks and goosebumps broke out over my skin. The hair on my arm stood up. He wore a long black coat. His skin was pale, strikingly so, his eyes dark, had no hair. Cold permeated the room. 
the heavy kind of cold that froze everything in its tracks that slowed time itself. My mom, a small, petite woman, was swallowed in the shadow. You smelled like vinegar. It was overwhelming. He looked out of place in our small apartment, a specter looming in the doorway. They spoke in hushed tones, his voice a void. I watched out of the corner of my eye from behind my couch. I thought he might be a tax collector or there to evict us. There was a seriousness about my mom's shoulders that reminded me of how she held herself when she spoke with the bank on the phone. She stepped back to let him inside. The way he moved was unnatural, as though he was gliding. They went into the small kitchen, my mom taking a seat at the table as the man stood in the corner. The harsh fluorescent light of the kitchen painted shadows on his face, obscuring his features. From his jacket, he produced a piece of paper, sliding it onto the table, followed by a pen. I watched my mom as she read it, her head in her hand. He stood in silence, watching, waiting. My mother's shoulders slumped. She signed the paper. In the corner, the man smiled. A thin, garish smile in the light. Something shifted in the air. I shivered. I couldn't see his eyes, but I knew he was looking at me. He collected the paper with reverence, pocketing it in his long, black jacket. He murmured something stepping out of the kitchen and into the dining room. My mom followed behind him, her arms wrapped around her middle. For the first time, I looked into his eyes. They were empty. Though I desperately wanted to, I couldn't look away. Ten years from now, your life is going to change, he said. The statement was flat, lifeless. A moment passed. He showed himself out, walking out of our lives. I assumed forever. I hoped forever. I stared at the door until my mom came and knelt in front of me, blocking it from view. Happy birthday, sweetheart. Over the years, I asked my mom about this incident, but she just got the same guarded smile with a vague explanation about a mortgage before she changed the subject. Not one birthday went by I didn't think about it. My 21st birthday and the life-changing promise loomed larger and larger the closer I got to it. That wasn't the only reason I could never forget that day. I saw him. The man. I saw him everywhere. Sometimes it was just a flash, a reflection in a window, in the TV. Others, it was more of a peeling, a pervading sense of dread and cold, always accompanied by the strong smell of vinegar. Once I was in a movie theater and this presence was so strong, I swore there was a hand on my shoulder that I could feel his empty, vacuous smile next to my ear. I ran out of the theater. My friends made fun of me for it for years. Sometimes I saw him, not a shadow, not a reflection, standing there, watching, smiling. I pretended I couldn't see him until he went away but he never truly went away. I jerk awake in the middle of the night, convinced someone had been standing over me only moments before. I only told one person about this, my best friend, Katie. We jokingly called the apparition Beingar. There are things you don't question as a kid. We moved into a house, a big one, After so many years in a small apartment worrying about money, it was the height of luxury. My mom became increasingly distant. It hurt, but her armor was seemingly unyielding. Soon after the move, my friend Katie bought a Ouija board over for a sleepover. With nervous anticipation, we laid it out, giggling, unsure what to do. We asked it about boys jerking away and laughing at the first signs of tentative movement, asking each other if the other moved the cursor, and both vehemently denying it. Let's talk to Vinegar, Katie asked, excited. To her, the specter that followed me around was a source of morbid curiosity. 
where she felt excitement. I felt fear. I wanted to know more about him too, though, and whatever he'd spoken to my mom about. Whatever contract they signed that left me with his shadow. Is Vinegar here? She asked. The cursor stayed resolutely still. My friend tried again. For a long moment, nothing happened. Then, slowly, surely, it slid across the board. The window coming to a stopover. Yes. We both stared at it, then at each other, shaking our heads at the silent question. Neither of us had moved it. What do you want? Another pause. We waited with bated breath. The familiar cold settled heavy in the air. The faintest sound of a whisper. The smell of vinegar. We read the letters aloud as the cursor skittered across the board. S. O. O. N. My stomach clenched with fear. Then... The cursor twitched, and we both jerked away from it as it burned. It began moving erratically on its own as we watched in growing horror. With jerky movements, the indicator darted and halted over a string of numbers. The date of my 21st birthday. Suddenly, he was right behind me. I knew if I turned around, I'd see his too pale face and two empty black eyes. I froze in terror, the cursor's movements growing even more frantic. My heart pounded against my ribcage, racing out of control. Panicked, I threw the board against the wall. Silence descended, interrupted only by my gasping breaths. Then, my friend laughed. Awesome, she declared it. I never used the Ouija board again. By the time I was 20, my mother and I may as well have been strangers. My impassioned plea for her to talk to me, to look at me, was met with silence, her expression unmoved. The specter was an almost constant now, a shadow I'd been forced to accept. Dread saturated my life and I became a shadow of myself, a certainty taking stronger hold every day that I was getting closer and closer to my execution. And then... Scientists announced that they discovered time travel. That they were working on a machine and training their first travelers, as they called them. Everything was about to change, they said. Jubilant, they set the date for the first voyage. The same date as my 21st birthday. I was in my apartment when I found out. My stomach dropped tried to swallow and and couldn't. This couldn't be a coincidence. Could it? The news reported on their progress as the day ticked closer. They speculated about the date they'd go to, forward or back. I already knew what date they'd choose. Ten years earlier, the same day the mysterious specter first knocked on my door, When my 21st birthday arrived, the entire world watched with excitement as they powered up the machine, wires and coils whirring, a steady hum filling the room as scientists gave updates on the status of the machine. The travelers stepped in the glass case, four men and women, excited, nervous, determined. A countdown blared. Five, four, three. The humming intensified. Zero. A tearing sound rent the air, one that you could feel in your bones. The travelers were screaming horrific, primal sounds as they were ripped apart and reassembled again and again until they seemingly were shorn out of existence. The broadcast cut out. The world ended that day. I'm not sure how long I stared blankly ahead, waiting. There was a knock on my door. Four sharp knocks. Dreamlike, I answered it. The man who had haunted me for years stood there, fully corporeal, just as he had a decade ago. Behind, where once the landscape had been verdant, it was now desolate. The sky purple and angry 
even though it was the middle of the day. Strange creatures twisted, all teeth and claws and tentacles snarling, shambling and galloping and screeching. The man smiled, that lipless smile, his eyes brighter than I'd ever seen them, some unidentifiable quality burning within. With purposeful movements, he reached into his jacket pocket and pulled out a crisply folded piece of paper. He held it out to me. Shock dictated my actions. I reached out and took it. When I unfolded it, certain words stuck out to me. Tethered. Fixed point. My mom's signature. The date of collection. Today's date. You're one of the travelers, I said as the fabric of reality was torn asunder behind him. He smiled. Images invaded my head as he stared at me, sharing his memories, images of a cavernous darkness and screaming and pain of being repeatedly torn apart. Impossibilities and monsters and demons as time lost meaning and reality collapsed in on itself. Gigantic creatures roaring, evolving and unnatural, the answer to our summons, rushing into the terror we created. Watching, existing, aging, unending pain, loss of self, mutating. And then, arriving, finally to the location and time they'd sought after. No longer quite human. Aged and monstrous. Unable to return home. Furious. Ten years to wait seemed like nothing compared to the near eternity they'd spent in a hellscape, exposed to so much horror as the world was unmade. But they were unmoored from time, outside of it. Discordant. The contract was only meaningful in that the intent inherent in it provided a thread for a lost traveler to follow, a guiding light. My mother signing that contract rang across the universe until it reached its terminus a fixed point in a destabilized universe. He'd followed me, shifting in and out, a shadowy constant in my life, tethered to me as I guided him back home. His energy manifesting in starts and stops as he grew more powerful the closer we both arrived at our destined meeting at the end of the world. And in return, I was not unmade as humans all around us screamed, transformed as their cells destabilized and reconstituted into twisting, mindless, pained creatures. What now? I asked. He smiled and held out his hand. Haven't we been here before? Maybe we will be again. And we're back. I hope you enjoyed that fiction bit. Okay, so a couple things on this one. Um, Like I said, this was based on a very vivid dream that I had and my love of time travel. So I believe I've talked about it before on the show, but uh, Vinegar is a real thing. (laughs) I hesitate at real, but it is something that I believed that I saw as a child. And I'm sure it was like the creepy child from a movie who can see ghosts that they can't see or whatever. I am very, very confident that I was just dealing with trauma. And also I had a friend who would really prop up. We both liked horror. We both liked these kinds of things. And she would really prop that up. So I would smell this vinegar and I would see this figure and uh, my friends knew. They, they knew about Vinegar. And the Ouija board instant is also true. And I just want to, you know, put out there, I love horror. I don't particularly believe in ghosts or anything, but I don't dismiss that I was going through something and it felt real at the time. But yeah, it did feel like something always hanging over me and always watching me. And I, again, I think that was my trauma 
but that was part of the inspiration of this story too. The title I got from, again, I love these technological, um, of applying these technological terms to these human, deep human experiences that we all go through. Uh, delete culture is a term that refers to an idea that you can just post something and then delete it and it's gone, but it's never actually gone. And so this idea in terms of like contracts and time travel, uh, I don't know. I just really like the title. I do think it's interesting, the idea of a parent selling the future of their child, knowing that in like 10 years time, in this case, their life is going to go terribly wrong. But in that mm-hmm. 10 years, you're going to have your fame, your fortune, or whatever it is. I, th- I find that really fascinating, especially in our culture of, and this is broad generalization, but in our culture of seeing kind of like pushing kids from a very young age to be Olympic athletes or actors or whatever it is, the, the parents kind of making this decision and then really pushing. Uh, and in the best case scenario, that works out great for everybody. But it doesn't always. It doesn't always. Yeah. So that is one thing that I've just been thinking about, I guess, on my mind. And kind of that whole signing of a contract and not worrying. Like, we're not going to worry about that now. We'll deal with that later. Uh, We'll find a way out of it. We'll find Mm -hmm. a way out of it. And then you can't. And I uh, clearly have a whole thing about, like, knocking and somebody coming, like, somebody being there that... Is mysterious. I'm getting like vibes just thinking about it. (laughs) But also, and I'm going to be real honest and admit this because I bet some of you picked up on it. I can't remember how it ended. (laughs) The dream. I don't remember how the dream ended. So I made up, like, I remember all the stuff leading up to it, but it's kind of without an ending. And it felt appropriate for a time travel story. Oh, so those are my nightmares. When yes. something doesn't end, mm-hmm. like when something doesn't end in the movie, I need an ending. I need closure, which mm-hmm. is one of the ways I prevent from being scared from a movie is I need to see an ending. Mm-hmm. So, ooh, that's even worse. Right. No, it is. It's upsetting. Uh, there's no real ending. And I just wanted to put that out there. I'm going to be real honest because I'm sure some of you were like, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> what? Wait. I'm not the only one that does it. There are plenty of movies that just sort of end. And oh, you're like, absolutely. Wait, what? Oh, <laughs> So, uh, as always, we hope you enjoyed. And yeah, look out for more interesting fiction content in the future. And as always, too, if you have uh, suggestions for something in the public domain we could read, that would be awesome. Yeah. So, please send those our way. Our email is stuffmediamomstuff at iheartmedia.com. You can find us on Twitter at Momstuff Podcast or on Instagram at Stuff I've Never Told You. Thanks, as always, to our super producer, Christine. Making the magic happen. Yes. And thanks to you for listening. Stuff I've Never Told You is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. <laughs>